Good afternoon, congregation. On behalf of the consistory with the deacons, we extend a warm welcome to everyone gathered here, especially guests and those who may be watching via the live stream. There are no additional announcements this afternoon. The offertory this afternoon is for word and deed. We welcome Reverend Bellinger this afternoon. We thank you for being willing to preach once again. We wish you the Lord's blessing for this preaching and pray that we are all edified and blessed by this preaching. It is a great privilege out of the storehouse of God's grace to be once again be assembled together in the courts of the Lord in the house of praise and prayer and proclamation. We're thankful that we may be gathered under the banner of God's love and in the testimony of his loving kindness, We're mindful of a wonderful text that comes to us from Isaiah uh, chapter 67, uh, 63 and uh, verse 7, where the Lord says, I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, this is his people, the praises of the Lord, according to all the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness to the house of Israel that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. Let us rise as we seek the face of the Lord in worship. Once again, it's our privilege to confess that our help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth. Beloved congregation, lift your hearts to heaven and receive the greeting of our God. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Then let us blend our voices as we continue to sing, as we sing together from Psalm 67, Psalm 67.
One of our greatest privileges is to confess the most holy faith, to give testimony of what the Lord gives us to believe. And what a privilege, what a blessing to believe. And let us give then words to what lives in our hearts as we sing together him to him to a great summary of the faith. Let's join our hearts together as one as we come before the throne of grace in the blessed exercise and gift of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy high and holy name. We thank thee that we may be gathered once again in the courts of the Lord as a foretaste of the blessing to come. We thank thee, Father, that as children we may declare our dependence, and we thank thee that the root of our dependence rests in the perfect obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we come to thee, Father, and by the leading of the Holy Spirit, we come to thee as the body of Christ to, to exercise our calling, to worship thee in spirit and truth, to be a congregation of brothers and sisters here in this place. We pray, Father, 
Be pleased by thy word and spirit to prosper the gospel ministry, the ministry of repentance and faith. We pray, Lord God, as we go forth in the hour at hand and the week before us, that we would receive help in our varied infirmities, that we might be strengthened in the once given holy faith, strengthened both in conviction and trust. Embolden us, we pray, to live out of our calling, to be ambassadors in thy name. We pray, Lord, that we might live with the confession of our faith close to our hearts. With the hymn writer of long ago, uh, we recognize at the cross, mercy was great and grace was free. And then the believer confesses, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. And we thank thee through the sacrifice of Christ that we have been uprooted from the deepest darkness and have obtained a, a new life solely by the favor of God. Christ dying to pay our penalty. He who lived for our righteousness, perfect obedience. Father, we pray, accept our praises. We give praise and adoration for our Savior. For he has burst the bands of death and trampled the powers of darkness down and lives forever. And so we pray, help us here, young and old alike, to live in the assurance that in Christ we died. In Christ we will rise. In his life we live and in his victory we triumph. In his ascension we shall be glorified. And so, Lord, help us to please thee, to know what it is, to test the spirits of our age. Lord, much conversation comes to our ears about an eclipse tomorrow. Lord, help us to recognize that as a wonder from thy hand. But help us also to realize that it is but a foreshadowing of the great eclipse to come. When the sun shall shine no more, when the moon shall be no more, when the stars shall be removed. That great day when Christ returns to usher forth the judgment that brings to the world to come. Lord, help us to be prepared for that and to prepare ourselves. As we go forward, Lord, we may not know what a day may bring, but in confidence we place our hands in thine, fully aware that it is thy hand in ours. Lead us through the pathways of life, be it joy or sorrow, pleasure or pain, success or failure. And give us a deep desire to love what thou lovest and a will to love thy holy will. As we open scriptures, soften our hearts. As we bear witness to our confession, Lord, give us willing spirits. Lord, bless now what is awaiting thy blessing, and hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. If you would take your Bibles and open them with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Going to read from Matthew chapter 16. And uh, we're going to begin our reading this afternoon at verse 13 and read to the conclusion of the chapter before we go to our second and third reading from the book of Acts. Now, this is the Holy Word of God that stands firm and sure forever, 
When, now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming into his kingdom. As we continue in the word, we turn to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, where we read 19 through 26. It's a testimony of the early church, those who have gone before us, those, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephan, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. And there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. And then a third passage, moving a few pages in the Holy Scriptures to the 26th chapter, Acts 26, uh, beginning at verse 19. We, we jump in, as it were, to... Paul's defense before Agrippa. Uh, The Apostle Paul has been uh, giving some uh, 
rehearsal, some expression as to what the Lord has done for him and to him in his conversion. And then at verse 19, we read, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds and keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and the Gentiles. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is, is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my, my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. And then the king rose, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So far, the blessed reading of the Holy Scriptures. We thank the Lord for giving us the light of his word by which we may see light. And we trust that the Lord will continue to add his blessing even as we receive uh, the proclamation of the word. Let's first uh, sing from Psalm 89. Psalm 89. We'll stand and sing the stanzas 1, 3, and 6.
We've been asked with you to consider with you Lord's Day 12. I invite you then to turn to the Heidelberg Catechism at this time. We live in an age where identity is a major theme, uh, how one identifies as. And we live in an age of great confusion uh, to the point where young children are confused whether or not they can identify as a boy as they were born or as a girl as they were born. Well, Lord's Day 12 is a wonderful testimony as to the Christian's identity, an identity that is rooted in Christ, and out of that identity, our identity is to be shaped and formed. It's a wonderful Lord's Day in that it's really a a six-part Lord's Day. One could say, well, we ought to have six sermons on on Lord's Day 12. And so this afternoon, it's merely a summary of the six parts that Lord's Day 12 sets before us. Uh, Lord's Day 12 at 31, speaking of our Savior. Why is he, Jesus, called Christ that is anointed? Because he has been ordained by God the Father and anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who has fully revealed to us the secret counsel and will of God concerning our redemption. Our only high priest, who by the one sacrifice of his body has redeemed us and who continually intercedes for us before the Father, and our eternal King, who governs us by his word and spirit, and who defends and preserves us in the redemption obtained for us. Question 32, but then why are you called a Christian? Because I am a member of Christ by faith, and thus share in his anointing so that I may, as prophet, confess his name. As priest, present myself a living sacrifice of thankfulness to him. And as king, fight with a free and good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and hereafter reign with him eternally over all creatures. Lord's Day 12. Beloved congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, when we testify concerning our Savior, we do so recognizing that Jesus is the Christ. And that testimony recognizes that our Redeemer, Defender, and Friend has come to us with a particular task, or we might say undertaking. That task is described for us in summary in question and answer 31. And those who confess the Savior in truth do so recognizing that the followers of Jesus also have been given a particular task, or we might say undertaking. And that is described for us in summary in question and answer 32. In his coming, Jesus received an anointing. Those who believe in true faith also have received an anointing. And this is so very important for us to understand and believe if we are to have any sense of who Jesus is and what our place in the world is to be. 
The catechism students will remember that the word anoint means to consecrate, to dedicate, to ordain. It is a word that is applied to both Jesus and the followers of Jesus. Our Savior is not simply called Jesus, the one who saves us from the consequences of our sins, but he is called Jesus the Christ. Christ is not so much a name, but a title, signifying the scope and breadth of the saving work of our Redeemer and how it is that we, you and I, are to respond to that saving work. In his baptism, Jesus was anointed and set apart for his public ministry. When Jesus asked his disciples as to what they understood concerning his identity, who do you say that I am, uh, there in reply came the conversation that spilled over in the region. There were those who thought Jesus to become the second coming of John the baptism, Baptist, or Elijah, or Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. And then Jesus asked more pointedly this question. He had first asked, who do the others think? Uh, uh, but more pointedly, he says now, uh, which is also a question for you and me, but who do you, who do you say that I am? Peter, speaking for the disciples, responded, declared, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus is called the Christ because he was ordained, commissioned, appointed by the Father to a particular task. And that task was sealed with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And our Savior has conducted himself precisely according to his mandate, precisely according to the title he has been given. The identity of Jesus is wrapped up in his title, Christ. Now, how are we to see his identity? Jesus, the Messiah, our Redeemer, the sacrificial lamb of God, appointed and anointed with that threefold focus. Appointed and anointed by the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who, who perfectly reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance. So that we might know the way to be delivered from sin and misery. In his coming, Christ Jesus has been given a prophetic office for our salvation. It is important that we see our need for a prophet. Treason against God in the fall has darkened mankind's understanding and clouded our judgment. We need a prophet who tells us the truth. We need a prophet who reveals to us the truth that sets us free. And without the light of the gospel, the good news, you and I, we would remain in the dark. So many in our present day society are in the dark because they have not received the revelation of the light of the prophet the Lord Jesus. The gospel writers tell us that the people were astonished at Christ's message. He taught with authority. He was unlike the rabbis and the religious leaders of their own day who simply commented and on the commentators. In the Old Testament, God commissioned his prophets to deliver his revelation. They were to serve as his mouthpiece or spokesman and that in itself is remarkable, considering the sinfulness of the people. But even more spectacular, amazing, wonderful, is the revelation of Jesus Christ, who is described as the Word of God made flesh. In other words, 
He not only delivers the word of the Lord, he is the word of the Lord who dwells among his people. Now, as a prophet, Jesus came to proclaim, to proclaim the message of the kingdom. He proclaimed the message calling for faith and repentance, a message that we must not only hear with our ears, but also respond in our hearts and lives. Repent and believe. Believers are not merely receivers of information or inspiration. They're called to respond to what they have received. Information and, and inspiration is for transformation. The prophet speaks, and you and I, we must listen. He is the master, and as his master, his word, his words must direct our paths. Now, by nature, you and I do not like to do what we are told to do. We see that very early in the lives of young children. As the parents give a beckoning call, it's, these little ones will sometimes just turn around and go in a different direction. Well, that's true for all of us by nature. We resist the authority structures in our lives. And without the word of life directing us, we, we would just wander through life aimless and pointless. Again, we see that so much in our society today. How many people are, are traveling life's path simply aimless and pointless. They have, it would seem, no lasting purpose. And how they need a prophet who perfectly reveals the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance. Brothers and sisters, if Christ had not come, we would be in the dark for eternity. Christ has revealed the gospel, the light. From him we learn what it is to, to be people of faith and, and what it is to live by faith, to be found faithful and full of faith, a, a life filled with the obedience of faith. Jesus tells us if you want to understand who God is and what God has done and what God is doing and what God will yet do, look to the Christ. Christ has come to tell us the way to enter the kingdom. And how is that way opened for us? Why? By his work as a priest. Christ was sent by the Father to serve as our only high priest in order to set us free by the one sacrifice of his body. And he, our Lord, who continually pleads our cause with the Father. In the Old Testament, the priest served as a vital role in the lives of God's people. They established, we might say, a crucial link between God and man, a link which had been severed by, by Adam's disobedience in the Garden of Eden. The priests were responsible for offering the sacrifices of atonement for the covenant people, and this was especially true with respect to the high priest on the Day of Atonement. And on that day, the priest would, would enter the Holy of Holies and he would he'd sprinkle blood on, on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. It would be a reminder to Israel that blood must be shed for the atonement of God's people. Blood was necessary in order to be accepted before the throne of the Father. When that work was completed, the priest would come back to the people with, with God's benediction. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In a certain way, you celebrated that in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper this morning. The priest represented the interchange and the exchange between God and his people. The priest showed what was necessary to come before the Father in such a way that our sins would not block such communion. A connection between the holy God and the holy, unholy people who needed to be made holy 
The priest gave testimony of God's blessing to the people as a, as a token of the freedom that is ours in the payment for sin. In our gospel lesson, the Lord Jesus announced his priestly work at verse 21. At that time, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed on the third day and be raised. In the previous verse, he had charged them not to tell others at that point he was the Christ because he needed to come to the day where he would ultimately fulfill his priestly work. Jesus, as the mediator of the covenant of grace, became the once-for-all sacrifice. You believe that, congregation? That sacrifice was given for you? And through that sacrifice, God's blessings rest on his people. And what a joy it must be for the believer to confess that, that Christ has come to offer himself for the sins of the people, your sin and my sin, through his offering, securing redemption. And then to furthermore confess that even now as we're gathered here in this place of worship, that Christ's priestly work continues for he is at the right hand of the Father making intercession on behalf of his people. He pleads our cause before the Father. He prays for us, interceding. He, he blesses us with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then there is that third office, that of his kingship. Already at his birth, we sing of the newborn king. Not only did Jesus Christ proclaim the kingdom, not only did Jesus Christ secure the kingdom by means of his sacrificial death, he is the king of the kingdom. He rules. He has dominion. He is busy gathering, defending, and preserving his church. He is the one who protects us from ourselves. And in faith, we confess that he will put all enemies under his feet. The Christian rejoices to confess that the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And the king governs his people by means of his word and spirit. He, he guards us and keeps us in the freedom that he has won for us. He, he leads the way. Christ has led the way through death, through which we must all face, through the grave. And his resurrection testifies to our resurrection. His ascension testifies that one day we shall also ascend to be with him on the new earth. As king, Christ Jesus says to us, in all the shadows of life, in the difficulties of life, in the questions of life, in the disappointments of life, follow me. I will carry your burdens. Follow me. I will lift up your burdens. When your life focuses on the fact that, that Jesus is king, we need to think about this congregation. Then we can let go of our desire to be in control of our own lives and we can rest in the sure promises that God has given us that he will lead the way step by step. Jesus Christ is coming to us again today, declaring, listen to me. Hear what I have to say. Believe in my work, and you will be safe and secure. Now, of course, this does not mean that, that life will become easy, easy street. But in the potholes of life, in, in the roads of construction in our lives, Christ Jesus will lead the way. He is the commander. He is the commander-in-chief. And his call, his bidding, his rule 
has been given to us for our comfort and joy. And these things must be so because those who have confessed Christ in truth have received a calling and an anointing. Why are you called a Christian? What is it that demonstrates, defines, describes who you are? If someone were to come to you with the question, who do you say you are? How is it that you and I, how is it that we are to respond? Well, we ought never identify, first of all, by, by our church affiliation, nor by what we do from day to day. Believers have received all of grace and identity in Christ. We live in a society that has an identity crisis. We made mention of that earlier. A crisis. And the only way to, as it were, be relieved of that crisis is to come to the understanding that God would have us live and believe. Christians have been anointed and appointed. An anointment and appointment received in our baptism. Second service this afternoon at three o'clock, there will be a baptism. And in that baptism, an anointment and an appointment. And those who embrace Christ in faith, those who have received Christ in his benefits, receive then a profound, deep, hearty calling. Christians are followers of Christ. And that too is unfolded in three ways. And once again, we use those, those very significant words, prophet, priest, and kings. Say so to the catechism kids, PPK. These are words that describe what a Christian is to look like. Well, in Acts chapter 11, we, we read of the ministry of the apostles at Antioch, and we read how they were busy teaching and preaching concerning Jesus Christ. For a full year, they had assembled with the church. They taught a great many people. And then we hear these beautiful, these wonderful words. And the disciples, that is the followers of Christ Jesus, were first called Christians in Antioch. They were identified, identifiable as a particular people. It's one thing to be identified by our ethnic heritage. It's one thing to be identified by our citizenship. But how more important to be identified as the followers of Christ Christian. A Christian is a prophet. A prophet. Not a prophet in the sense uh, that we are instruments of a new revelation from God, for the canon of God's word has been completed. But prophets in the sense that our task as a church and as the Lord's people is to openly proclaim the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. Go tell it on the mountains. Go tell it in the valleys. Tell the truth about Jesus Give the reason of the hope that lies within you. For we have been anointed to confess the name of the Lord. We are more than hearers of the word, for prophets are also doers of the word. And when God gives us opportunity to bear witness to the word, not only in our daily example, but with the words that we speak, then we are to exercise our prophetic role in speaking of Christ. What does this world need? This world needs Christ. And how many people also in our own neighborhoods have no understanding of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. In Acts 26, we heard King Agrippa respond to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. 
Paul had been testifying that the message was a message of life. It was a message proclaimed openly and not just in a little corner over there. No, a message of comfort, a message of the power of Christ's resurrection glory. This is our calling, brothers and sisters, and pray that the Lord would help each one of us to answer that calling. Now, the Christian is not only a prophet, but also a priest. Believers desire to present themselves to Christ as a living sacrifice of thanks. And, and one way to, to do that in a wonderful way is to be assembled together as the congregation, as the body of Christ, in worship to the triune holy God. We're to be gathered as that living sacrifice of thanks. Already, already sorry, in, in uh, Exodus 19, God describes his people as a kingdom of priests whose lives are to be dedicated to the Lord's service. Our bodies to be living sacrifice of service to Christ and his cause. Christ and his kingdom. Christ and his crown, Christ and his covenant. The principal cause of Christ rests in his church. We must love the church, serve the church. We must, as priests, give ourselves to the life of the church. But by extension, Christ's kingdom includes the family and our work and how it is that, that we serve one another in Christ's name. One of the liberty, liberating principles of the Reformation was the restoration of the call of the priesthood of all believers, not just the clergy, but the entire congregation, the priesthood of all believers, a priesthood that, that then also seeks out the lonely, the afflicted, those who sorrow, those who struggle, a priesthood that sacrifices. And again, we must say, the Lord has given us a lofty calling, a calling that, that calls us to partake of Christ's sufferings. And in the society that we live, more and more we will uh, be called to suffer as a Christian. There's that bill that's coming before uh, Parliament that uh, seeks to muzzle the mouth of the Christian under the guise of the hate crime. Our witness is mocked. Our call to uphold the commands of God is ridiculed. The lifestyle that, uh, that the Bible calls us to live is laughed at. Now what does the Bible tell us? If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. God will give strength where strength is required. And strength then to be a king. A king is to strive, that is to uh, exercise effort with a good conscience against sin and the devil in this world. That's again a a lofty calling. Through Christ, we are regarded before the Lord as nobility. Uh, the king has princes and princesses. We have a regal calling and task. We have a marching order to follow our king. We represent the king as his ambassadors and as his soldiers. And it is our calling to uphold his authority. Kingdom rule must be promoted. Kingdom rule in all areas of life, politics, agriculture, reform, Christian education, business, and commerce. Because Jesus, Christ Jesus, reigns as king, we can be assured of the victory. We can be assured that he will lead us victorious. Christians are those who will one day isn't it amazing? Reign with Christ over all creation for all eternity. 
And we who are in this world of preparation, we're the pilgrims, we're preparing for the prepared place, we already may be setting our sights on the tasks to come. And what a glory, what a glory is ours. And so, beloved congregation, as we reflect on the summary of Scripture, as we have heard it in Lord's Day 12, we have much to, to think about, to ponder, to, to pray, to exercise, to be a prophet, a priest, and a king is more than a hollow slogan. It is an act of calling. And it is a calling that can be answered for it is a calling that rests in Christ, our chief prophet and teacher, our only high priest and our eternal king. It is a calling that is upheld in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It is a calling to be believed. It is a calling to be lived. And may the Lord so help us. May he give much grace. And may we receive much grace to rejoice in the identity of Christ, the person of Christ and to be found faithful to his call, to the identity that he gives us out of the storehouse of his grace and love. Amen. Well, let us reply with the church of long ago as we sing from Psalm 105, 105, the stanzas one, two, three, and four.
Shortly before this service, I was notified that uh, Sister Ange Osterhoff is scheduled to undergo medical procedure on Thursday, so we'll remember this in prayer as well. Uh, but before we come to the Lord in prayer, we'd like to share with you that our brother Mark Ludwig has experienced some significant mental health challenges over the years. Currently, he is struggling to the point where he has admitted himself to a treatment facility beginning already tomorrow. We will beseech our God to bless this process, asking for relief and for comfort during a difficult time. We do so humbly acknowledging that we have a Savior who has died for our sins, but we also know that we can pray boldly since this Jesus is also the Christ, the anointed one, anointed as king over all creation. Let us boldly seek him in prayer. Heavenly God and Father, we acknowledge your kingship, your power over all creation, and we stand amazed at who you are. As we learn more about you and the son that you sent to redeem a broken world, the spirit moves our hearts to worship. Your glory truly does reach far above the skies. We're thankful to you for outpouring your outpouring of love to us as we seek to serve you. You bless us with faithful preaching and the sacraments that confirm us in our relationship with you. You also guide us with your faithful word, including passages like Psalm 136, where we're taught and repeatedly reminded that your steadfast love is sure it shall evermore endure. You stretched out your mighty hand and brought out Israel from Egypt's land. For your steadfast love is sure, it shall evermore endure. You remembered <clears throat> all our woes and redeemed us from our foes. For your steadfast love is sure, it shall evermore endure. Food to all will you supply. We praise you, God, enthroned on high, for your steadfast love is sure. It shall evermore endure. Lord, we remember our sister, Ange Osterhoff. We pray for a blessing over the procedure that she'll undergo on Thursday. May she be kept in your loving care. And may Reese, Ange, and their family continue to feel your love and care always. Lord, we ask you to surround our brother Mark Ludwig and his family with your love. As they travel difficult roads, we thank you that they can continue to confess that your steadfast love is sure. It shall evermore endure. Bless the treatment and attention that he receives over the coming weeks. Lord, provide relief. Provide for him and his family some answers, solutions that prove helpful. Give them all a spirit of understanding and peace so that they can rest in you trusting in you to carry them through this. For your steadfast love is sure, it shall evermore endure. Lord, be with his wife, Arlene, who you have called to stand beside him in all of this. Continue to give her strength each day to support, encourage, and love him. Help her to remain patient in times of frustration and continue to lean on you for all things needed, especially in the days ahead as contact with her husband will be limited. Heavenly Father, we know our brother is not the only one who experiences these kind of difficulties. We thank you for his efforts to provide a godly example, even as he struggles with himself. And so we pray for all those among us who experience anxiety, panic attacks, depression, and the like. There are also many of us who have family and friends outside this congregation who deal with these things to a significant degree. Lord, help us to understand that we don't always understand. Help us to trust, even when trusting doesn't seem logical. Open doors for relief, for improvement, even complete healing. For your steadfast love is sure, it shall evermore endure. For the family members and the friends who walk alongside your children who suffer like this, Lord, give wisdom and patience. Use them to show your love, that we may all be confronted with the undeniable reality that you love your people and that we know that you hear our cries for help and all our tears are kept in your bottle. In all this, Lord, we admit our weaknesses and failings. Forgive us all where we misstep, when we lose patience, when we give poor advice or we show lack of compassion. Help us to cry out to you constantly when we are confronted with our limited understanding. Let us be amazed when we see the complexity of the mind and the body that you have created and let that lead us to trust in you. We pray this in the name of our chief prophet, 
our only high priest, and our eternal king, whose steadfast love is sure and shall evermore endure. Amen. The congregation now has the opportunity to give the gifts of the gifts given to them by the Lord. As announced, the opportunity will be for word and deed. Following the collections of your offerings, we will sing from Psalm 52, stanzas 5 and 6, where we again confess that our God gives peace and rest.
But now, beloved congregation, we who identify as Christ followers, Christians, go forth to proclaim his name. Lift your hearts to heaven and receive the parting benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.